The Peruvian President Pedro Castillo welcomed OAS's decision to activate the Democratic Charter and send a mission to Peru. In Belgium, EU heads of state and government reached a fragile agreement and commissioned a concrete proposal to cap rising energy prices. Ukrainian attacks, humanitarian caravan in Kherson with US made HIMARS missile, before this report at least 4 dead and 10 wounded. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. The Peruvian President Pedro Castillo welcomed organizations of American states' decision to activate the Democratic Charter and send a mission to Peru. Through his Twitter account, he called on the representatives of the Congress and the judiciary to make an analysis of the real situation and propose solutions for the benefit of the Peruvian people. During the permanence of the mission, Castillo stated that the people can no longer tolerate political confrontations nor the politicization of justice and insisted on initiating a dialogue for a national, democratic and social commitment. The OAS approved the creation of a commission that will visit the country and at the same time urge for a preventive solution to the political crisis in the country through dialogue. In Bolivia, the government of President Luis Arce is betting on dialogue to confront a new destabilizing campaign by the right wing against the population census. From the Department of Santa Cruz, stronghold of the country's right wing, Governor Fernando Camacho is leading the idea of an indefinite strike in response to the postponement of the population census, a process that the right wing believes will provoke a redistribution of legislative seats favorable to their interests. Camacho declared that the stoppage will be called on Saturday if the executive does not revert its decision to hold the census in 2024. President Luis Arce summoned social and union movements to dialogue and call for unity and popular mobilization to face the attacks. In Colombia, coca production increased exponentially during the mandate of former President Ivan Duque, according to the most recent United Nations report on drug trafficking. In this regard, the text highlighted that coca production reached the maximum level, going from more than 1,200 metric tons in 2020 to 1,400 metric tons in 2021. They highlight that 45% of all coca is registered in 10 municipalities of the country and close to 50% in special management zones and in lands where Afro-descendants and natural reserves reside. The document highlighted that this would be the highest figure registered by the UN since it started its monitoring of cocaine production in 2001. Construction workers in Uruguay carried out a national strike in defense of social rights and demanding the government to adopt measures to face the increase of poverty and unemployment. Colleagues continue to arrive from the different workplaces. Today the entire construction industry is mobilizing from every corner of the country. The problem is very clear. The day before yesterday, during all these months, the government has announced that the economy has grown that it will continue growing. In fact, even the International Monetary Fund came out yesterday to affirm it. But at the same time that the economy is growing, inequity is growing as a result of the policies that this government carries out. That is why we are here today, as we were yesterday at the university gates to march to the legislative palace because education is being cut and this is a problem for the workers' children, for the future generations but also for the construction workers. In Brazil, the Superior Electoral Court will investigate an alleged disinformation network to favor the candidacy of current president Jair Bolsonaro. The decision of the Superior Electoral Court was in response to a lawsuit issued by the campaign of the candidate and former president Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, in which they denounced an alleged disinformation scheme led by Councilman Carlos Bolsonaro, son of the current president. In this regard, the president of the Superior Electoral Tribunal, Alexander de Moraes, assured that there is a proliferation of fake news and a growing aggressiveness of hate speeches since the beginning of the electoral campaign. 
Therefore, the TSC established that the internet companies themselves should identify the owners of some 30 profiles on social networks that support this campaign of disinformation and violence aimed at spreading lies about Lula da Silva and his candidacy. Also in Brazil, presidential candidate Lula da Silva walked with a crowd of citizens during his visit to the city of São Gonçalo in the state of Rio de Janeiro. Lula gathered thousands of people during a massive rally this Thursday afternoon. The presidential candidate spoke about the need for the new Brazilian government to work on the creation of new jobs due to unemployment the people of Gonçalo suffered from. Lula urged the citizens to exercise the right to vote in the electoral runoff election next October 30th. The walk also included the participations of different political leaders in the state of Rio de Janeiro. Let's take a short break, but first, remember you can now follow us on TikTok at the account at Telesur English, in which you will be able to see news in different formats, news updates, and much more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. On Friday, EU heads of state and government reached a fragile agreement and commissioned a concrete proposal to cap rising energy prices. For some, such as the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, the agreement is incongruent. The document signed in Brussels agrees to the intervention of the energy market. They commit themselves to jointly and compulsorily acquire at least 15% of the reserves and to establish a flexible limit for the prices of gas purchases. To this end, EU leaders entrust the community executive with an urgent proposal. After 11 hours of negotiations, they closed the agreement which leaves doubts such as those expressed by the German Chancellor. Germany fears that gas producers will sell to other countries. Two major Belgian trade unions organized demonstrations in front of European Union's headquarters on Thursday to protest against rising prices and government policies following the imposition of a series of sanctions against Russia, energy and commodity prices have risen sharply in Europe, severely damaging the economy and people's livelihoods. Many of the protesters were sh shouting slogans hoping that EU leaders attending the summit would pay more attention to people's demands and come up with practical measures to improve people's economic well-being. The soaring prices are making life difficult for ordinary people, coupled with the approaching winter public concerns over unaffordable heating costs are increasing. It's to let the, to, to let the European uh, institution to hear the voice of the people, because here in Belgium, but overall in Europe, and uh, there is a big problem for people to pay the bill, to pay the electricity bill, and because a lot of people have to make the choice be between to eat to, to have a, a, a house uh, and or to pay the, the bill of electricity and it is a big problem for us and but there is solution and the solution ha in the hands of European inst institution so we have to let hear the voice of the people here today. British Prime Minister Liz Truss announced on Thursday that she would resign after just six weeks in office following a disastrous economic plan that sent the, pl the pound plunging and her government into chaos. Having been formally appointed by Queen Elizabeth II on September 6, Truss is now the shortest serving Prime Minister in British history and will be remembered as one of the most disastrous. The previous holder of this record, George Canning, lasted 119 days in the early 19th century a leadership contest to decide the next leader of the ruling Conservative Party, who will be by default become the next Prime Minister, is now underway and will conclude in the next week. In the United Kingdom, following the Prime Minister's resignation, citizens give their, their views on the work of our government and the crisis facing the European nation. It's just a last long tale and a lot of shambles basically I mean I think it's a bit of an embarrassment to the country if I'm honest with you but it's it's the right thing to happen but 
you know, we need to get ourselves together pretty quickly is my answer. It's the right thing to happen, needs it to happen. Um, feel for a bit, don't want to see a, a fellow human in that kind of situation, but it's definitely the right thing. Yeah, it's not good. I mean, I don't think it, it, um, I don't think it's very good for, you know, the electorate. Like, it shows we've made the bad decision because we've picked someone who doesn't understand what's going on. It looks pretty poorly on, on us as well, frankly, as a, as a country. New Zealand farmers protest around Parliament buildings in Wellington to show their opposition to the government's proposed tax on agricultural emissions and carbon farming. Convoys of tractors, 4x4s and farmyard vehicles disrupted traffic in Wellington, Auckland and other major centres as protesters demanded the government abandon plants for an animal tax. Farmers rallied to warn that the tax would make food more expensive and jeopardise their livelihoods. Earlier this month, Prime Minister Hacinda Ardern touted that world first tax on methane and nitrous oxide emissions produced by the country's 6 million cows and 26 million sheep as a step toward combating climate change. Ardern has argued that the tax is necessary to meet climate targets and could even benefit farmers if they can charge more for climate-friendly meat. On Friday, Ukrainian missile attack kills four people and injures 10 in the newly annexed region of Kherson. According to the interim leader Vladimir Saldo, Ukraine fired HIMARS missiles at a civilian convoy crossing the Antonovsky Bridge. Regional authorities and military ships in Moscow warned as early as last Tuesday that they had reliable information of possible Kiev actions that could, could constitute war crimes and therefore began the evacuation of civilians to ensure their safety. It was one of these humanitarian missions that was hit by the Ukrainian attack. More news coming up after the show break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. At least 50 people were killed when a police clashed with demonstrators in the Chadian capital during a banned protest against the ruling military. These confrontations followed the prolongation of the transition for two years. This decision, following an inclusive and sovereign national dialogue boycotted by much of the opposition, has further embittered the political and armed opposition and baffled the international community, which had backed Debbie 18 months ago. On April 20th, 2021, following the death of Marshal Devi, who was killed by rebels, the army proclaimed his son, Mahatma Devi, a 37-year-old general, as head of a junta of 15 generals for an 18-month transition period leading to elections. Young protesters clashed on Thursday with security forces in the Ghanaian capital, Conakry. The National Front for the Defense of the Constitution, which had called the protest, said five people had suffered gunshot wounds, one of whom was in a critical condition. The West African state has been under military government since a September 2021 coup that ousted President Alpha Conde after more than 10 years in power. Social movement had called for peaceful demonstrations to take place in Conakry on Thursday, followed by nationwide protests on October 26. On Thursday, renewed famine warning for drought hit Somalia. According to the UN's World Food Program, a rare famine declaration could be made soon. Thousands of people died, many of them children. The WFP says many families arrived in Andolos camp travel from regions such as Bakul and Bai, among the worst affected by the drought. Thousands of people died in Somalia due to the drought, including nearly 900 children under five being treated for malnutrition, according to the United Nations data. The UN said half a million such children are at risk of health, of death. The WFP is calling for more support. WFP has massively scaled up our response in Somalia with the support of the international community. But the hunger and nutrition crisis is still very severe, especially in places like Baidoa, 
where we're still in a desperate race against time to avert looming famine. Unfortunately, despite incredible efforts, there's still so much to be done. We are only at the beginning of this crisis, and I fear the worst is yet to come. Syria and Russia denounced that Western powers are preventing the return of Syrian refugees to their homeland at the closing of the fifth joint Syrian-Russian meeting. A correspondent, Hisham Wanos, brings us the details. The Syrian-Russian ministerial coordination bodies assured at the end of this fifth joint meeting that both allied countries spare no efforts to ensure the return of Syrian refugees and displaced people to their homes, an effort they claim made possible the return of nearly six million Syrians. The establishment of a joint Syrian-Russian commission in 2018 to date. However, they condemned that this figure could be higher had it not been for the refusal of Western House countries which politicize the refugee dossier in the service of their anti-Syrian agenda. We work to assure a dignified return of all Syrian refugees and displaced persons to their homes, which is why we call on the world community to put pressure on Western countries to stop the politicization of this issue, put a name to occupation and the plundering of all resources, lift sanctions, and allow the reconstruction of our country in order to advance the process of the returns of refugees. Several Syrian-Russian ministerial meetings marked the working agenda of this meeting, during which various cooperation agreements were signed in sectors such as electricity, communications, water resources, oil, education, scientific research, and culture of vital importance for the recovery and reconstruction of Syria. A photographic exhibition documenting the destruction suffered at the hands of the neo-Nazis and the terrorists at several Russian and Syrian worship sites was also organized to demonstrate that extremism is a threat that affects humanity. We must act together to eradicate it. These bilateral meetings of the ministerial coordination bodies are customary at every joint civil Russian meeting on the return of refugees and also result in the signing of cooperation agreements in many areas in order to improve the situation in Syria and create a suitable environment for the return of refugees. This exhibition is part of the cultural cooperation which we promote as part of the strategic alliance between the two countries and it sheds light on the Russian places of worship destroyed by the Ukrainian Nazi army and the Syrian convents destroyed by armed extremists and this shows the importance of our alliance because we have a common enemy and a common destiny. During the four days of the meeting, the authorities in Moscow distributed several batches of humanitarian aid in the different Syrian provinces, a contribution that Damascus and Moscow consider essential to counteract the effects of the blockade imposed by the same Western states that accuse the Syrian government of not providing adequate conditions for the return of the refugees. We have come to the end of this news program. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tesoenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.